Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. I hope you're having a wonderful Oxford Real Farming Conference experience, whether in person or virtual. Uh, I'm Tiffany Patton, a co-director at Real Food Media, where we collaboratively create movement building communication strategies and media for liberation, justice, and joy in the food system. Um, and as a co-director, I get to work on various aspects of our programming, including events, communication strategy development, and, co and I'm a co-host of our podcast, Real Food Reads. And that podcast is actually where I got to virtually meet Liz and Ide for the very first time just last year. And I'm really thrilled to be able to bring that conversation here with you all. Uh, Liz and Ide are just brilliant and passionate, and I feel really honored to just exist in the same space as them. Um, so a little bit more about Liz and Ide. Uh, Liz Carlisle is an assistant professor in the environmental studies program at UC Santa Barbara, where she teaches courses on food and farming. She has, three, she has written three books about regenerative farming and agroecology, Lentil Underground, Grain by Grain with co-author Bob Quinn, and most recently, Healing Grounds, Climate, Justice, and the Deep Roots of Regenerative Farming. Um, and prior to her career as a writer and academic, she spent several years touring rural America as a country singer. And Ida Guzman is a dope researcher. She's a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC Irvine. Um, where Ida examines agroecological agro approaches that could harness biodiversity and ecosystem functioning for improved agricultural resilience. The overarching goal of their research program is to support farmers, especially those who are historically underserved, through research, education, and outreach that builds on their innovations and demonstrates ecological pathways to agricultural resilience. So today we're talking about Liz's third book, Healing Grounds, but more specifically, um, chapter three, which features Ida, uh, and that chapter is called The Hidden Hotspots of Biodiversity. So we're going to talk about those hidden hotspots, um, why, diverse, why diversity is important above and below the ground, and how we can cultivate diversity, not just in the soil, but in our farmers as well. And just a reminder, we're going to have a Q&A after this. So um, you can just save your questions for then, or you can type them in and we'll get to them in the Zoom afterwards. And I hope you can join us for that. So yeah, thank you, Liz and Ida, for being here this morning. i um, really happy to see you both. <laughs> Thrilled to get to be in conversation with you two. <laughs> this is definitely work worth uh, waking up early for, for those of us out here on the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say good morning, but... <laughs> Um, okay, so um, Liz, I want to start with this book. Um, I want to know what drove you to write Healing Grounds and like why now? Mm. Yeah, well, this has been, I think, a long time coming for me. What really got me interested in agroecology and regeneration on land was my grandmother's stories. Uh, my grandmother was raised on a homestead in western Nebraska in the U.S., and her family lost that farm in the Dust Bowl. And I was really um, struck from a very young age about her stories of growing up on land, which wasn't something that I really had the opportunity to do in the same way. I certainly got to do a lot of outdoor stuff, but I didn't make my, my family didn't make our livelihood on land. We didn't grow our own food. Um, and so I wanted that kind of land connection for myself. Um, but my grandmother was also really honest with me, you know, as far as her understanding had taken her about what went wrong with that form of farming um, that that preceded set, or that um, you know followed settler colonial period? Um, so her family, this you know family from Europe, not that many generations before, found themselves on this arid prairie um, and really overplowed it. Um, th that was the advice that her father was given, and she sort of saw that happen in real time that they damaged the land and then they undermined the possibility for their own lives um, and for their own community's life together. And so that kind of planted a seed in me to think about how to heal um, all of those historical problems that continue as our legacy of the dominant form of farming in the United States and in, in much of the world, certainly the global north today, and, you know, so eventually um, I started asking other farmers and families um, with farming legacies about their stories. And this book for me has been really important because 
in doing this work for a dozen years or so, it's become increasingly clear to me that the most important leaders in this movement are communities of color and indigenous communities who have been on the front lines of this colonial form of agriculture that's extractive for hundreds of years and whose ancestral forms of farming and foodways are regenerative and have been for a long time <laughs> and who have been really struggling to re-implement those forms of farming and, and land access and stewardship in the face of all of the violences of colonialism. And so that leadership, I think, is really, really important to center. And it helps us think about regeneration in a much deeper and more powerful way that ultimately can actually help us respond to big challenges like climate change. Mm. Nice. Thank you. Um... I'd love to know about how the two of you came to meet and how your work intersects. Yeah. Uh, Ida, do you want to? <laughs> started, Liz. I'll follow from there. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll just say um, this whole journey in agroecology brought me to UC Berkeley as a graduate student in 2009. And um, I remember very clearly everybody, the sort of buzz when Ida showed up on campus a few years later is like, there's an incredible uh, new graduate student. She's coming from University of Wisconsin with a bunch of lab experience already. She's got really, really ambitious and exciting ideas about the work she's gonna do here. Um, and then I remember seeing Ida present her work just across the street from Berkeley um, and just being struck by, how interdisciplinary it was that she was looking at biodiversity both below ground and above ground in the same project in her dissertation and that she was collaborating with small farmers in the Central Valley, mostly immigrants who have been totally underserved by research and technical assistance. And she was learning all these really interesting things about the biodiversity in their farming systems. And so um, I was really fortunate. I reached out to her when I was working on this book and in the midst of her incredibly busy life of research and outreach and incredible mentoring um, of early career researchers, um, she found some time to speak with me and I got to learn even that more, <laughs> not only about her work, but about the deep roots of why she's researching these questions, mm -hmm. which are also really interesting. Yeah, um, well, I have similar uh, like perspectives on Liz when I first got to uh, grad school. And I think we overlapped or barely overlapped in grad school. And either way, when I started grad school, everyone was like, there's this person, Liz, who's written this mm -hmm. book. I think even before she had finished her dissertation, had already published her book. So um, that was really cool. And I think it, the book that you mentioned earlier, Tiffany, Lent on the Ground. But uh, I think Liz and I really started talking right at the beginning of COVID when I think Liz was starting to research things about this book. And honestly, like we talked, I didn't really know where it was going, but it was just nice for me to just chat with someone about these topics I really cared about while mm -hmm. the world felt like it was falling apart. And it was, so good to just sit and talk about, you know, regenerative agriculture, agroecology, and the things that really make me really passionate. That's awesome. I'm glad you all were able to find each other and have that community and a mutual like learning exchange. Um, okay, so this chapter that we are focusing on today, Hidden Hotspots of Biodiversity, um, takes us to the California Central Valley. And we've already mentioned it a few times, but um, can one of you share like about the Central Valley, about the Central Valley, like what it's known for, what it's like there? Yeah, I'll get started because this is um, not only where I grew up, but it's also where I do most of my research. And for people who don't know, the Central Valley is this like center region in California that uh, has been at the butt of many jokes and even in movies, like you don't want to end up in Fresno, which is one of the biggest cities there. And but it's also one of the most agriculturally productive regions in uh, the U.S. And it grows a bunch of different crops like almonds, pomegranates, peaches, lettuce, tomatoes, etc. And it's a really transformed, it's a radically transformed landscape from what it was um, 100 years ago. And when you drive down, you know, this is really long highway. You just see that you just see these thousands of acres of monocultures like growing up I could drive for a few minutes and still see almond trees after almond trees and it it's that's what people's perspective of this landscape is and when they imagine this agriculture landscape and you know like I said I grew up there and you know that is part of what it is but if you drive around you know what you'll see within this landscape you'll if you look a little closer if you start driving you'll see these really small scale farms and they're 
small, a few acres from like one acre to at most sometimes 40 acres. And they represent less than 1% of the agricultural landscape there. But they're actually these like biodiverse hotspots or when I started my doing my research, my PhD advisor called them these oases. So instead of these monocultures just growing, you know, 100 or 1,000 acres of almonds, on these 25 acres on average, they're growing 50 to 100 different crops over the year. Yeah. And so for my own work, that's one thing I wanted to focus on. I wanted to think about how these farms who had established themselves in the last few decades had transformed the landscape. And one other important part of this is that these farmers who are managing this land are mostly immigrant refugee farmers. They're refugees from Laos, Thailand, um, predominantly Hmong, and also Mexican farmers who used to be farm workers who now wanted to farm their own piece of land. And so I was really interested in how, you know, they've taken these monoculture farms and transformed them to this crop diverse farm and what that had done to the landscape. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about that research, uh, the yeah. question answer and your methodology and results? Yeah, so I was mostly interested in, you know, what, how it affected biodiversity, these farms. Mm -hmm. And I'd come from a very conservation biology angle when I first came into the lab and I was interested in the biodiversity we can see, specifically these wonderful specialty species called squash bees, which are really cute and they really depend on squash. And so one of the questions I was interested in, if if you have a monoculture of squash, like how does that impact uh, these squash bees? Do they prefer these monocultures since there's a lot of squash? Or what about these polycultures that are growing a few rows of squash? Like how does that impact the squash bees? That's one question I was interested in. But I was also interested in the biodiversity we can't see. And I'm really interested in symbiotic relationships like pollinators and plants. But I was also interested in this fungi, which is called our buscular mycorrhiza fungi, which is also the symbiotic, um, also forms a symbiotic relationship with plants. And I was interested, you know, we know very little about them, how, you know, transforming this landscape into this really simplified manner had impacted these communities, but then what happened in the reverse? Can establishing a more diverse uh, agricultural system restore these fungi or were they lost? Like, you know, what had happened here? Mm -hmm. um, so in your research, did you find like, did the squash bees prefer the monoculture fields of squash or do they prefer the, the polyculture ones? Yeah, this is one of my first chapters and one of the things I was most surprised by. So. I, like I said, I was interested in, you know, squash bees, which prefer squash pollen, you know, do they go to the squash monocultures? And early on in grad school, one of my uh, uh, committee members was like, you know, I had this hypothesis, like, oh, these polycultures are going to support all these squash bees. And then, and then he was like, but why? He's like, but squash bees prefer squash pollen. Like, wouldn't the squash monocultures prefer that? And I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> like you might be right, you know, like, so then I kind of, you know, I, I got my field season ready and I went out there and, you know, started sampling all these bees. And, and then I started like noticing, I was like, wait, I think he was wrong. You know, there's all these other types of not only more squash bees, a more diverse community on these polyculture farms. And so, uh, you know, I analyzed the data and that's what I found. I was like, <laughs> I even presented the poster at a pollinator conference and I told my community members like, hey, come. And he was at a different university. I was like, look what I found. Um, but <laughs> one of the reasons why I think this was happening was that um, so these these squash bees prefer squash pollen, and that's the main source of, of like calories. And also, it's really essential for them to, you know, uh, to grow as a population. They you know they put a little bit of pollen, and then put an egg, and that's where the bee can um, uh, more bees can like the population can grow. Uh, but they also need nectar, and it's kind of like their daily sort of. Uh, other energy source that they need. And so one thing that I think was happening was that, yes, these uh, polyculture farms had a few rows of squash, and that was really essential for um, pollen, but they also were growing a wide uh, other resource diverse source of nectar from all these other mm -hmm. uh, crops. So these squash bees were able to get, yeah, their needs met with pollen, but they were also able to get it from nectar. But then it could also be a number of other reasons. Um, these squash monoculture farms grow squash for a short amount of time, then they till it, and then it's gone. And so these squash bees kind of like, wait, you know, it's gone. So I think polycultures provide a more uh, consistent source of pollen where they grow squash throughout the year from summer squash to winter squash. And also, you know, some farmers will say, I planted squash now, then a month later, they plant squash again. So it's consistent. Mm -hmm. um, and so it could also be a number of other reasons for that. And 
so yeah, that was an exciting uh, finding, and I'm excited like to look at other things because yeah, I was surprised, especially since my committee member took me this whole other path, and then I got, I got then you know whiplash, and I was like, wait, this is actually a great thing for squash bees. Yeah, or, that's, mm-hmm. that's really interesting. But I guess that also makes sense, right? Like I don't most most people don't want to eat the same thing every yeah. day. And so exactly. it makes sense that squash bees like also want to diversify their their diet. Yeah. No, in fact, there's a lab mate of mine who I was trying to think of a title for a presentation. She's like, what about diverse plates picky eaters? You know, <laughs> you know, squash bees are picky, um, but then you get this diverse plate of food. Like, what do they actually go for? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Um, okay, so now I would love to hear more about our vascular mycorrhizal fungi. What are they? How do plants and these fungi interact? What's so special yeah. about them? Yeah. Yeah. Tell us everything. <laughs> yeah, I have the pollinator people or pollinator research don't feel cheated, but I started with I started uh, working in agriculture and I kind of had this kind of security as well and how I came to study our vascular mycorrhizal fungi. But yeah, I love bees, um, but I also fell deeply in love with the below ground biodiversity on these farms and in particular symbiotic fungi. And so uh, one of these a group of organisms are called our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. And one thing I tell students is to, to really understand our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, you have to go back 450 million years ago. And that really puts it in context. And so these fungi are that old, they've been around for that long, but one of these like critical points in these years ago was that they actually helped plants get onto land. And so they were really critical for that. And one of the reasons why is because early land plants had such a limited root system. So, you know, when they were trying to access water and nutrients, like they really, you know, imagine having, you know, people say the T-Rex with short arms, right? <laughs> but, like, kind of like the plants are kind of had like really small roots, so they couldn't really grow, go out and grab these resources. And that's where these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, I call them AMF for short. So these AMF came in. And so they formed a symbiotic relationship with plants where they go into the roots and in the roots, they um, they form this association and then they form these filaments called hyphae that go into the soil. So they're able to explore the soil much further than the roots. And then, then these filaments are kind of a transportation system for nutrients. And so they grab nitrogen and phosphorus from the soil, which are critical nutrients for the plants or even water. And then they bring those nutrients into the plant. So now these plants who form these associations with AMF get more nutrients and are able to grow better. But AMF don't do this for um, nothing. They um, get carbon in return from plants, which are, you know, sugars for for the AMF. And so, um, you know, these fungi have become really important. Um, They're kind of ubiquitous, people say. They're the rule rather than the exception. And they're thought to associate with more than 80% of plants on land. And so, you know, as someone who studies agriculture, I was interested, you know, there's a lot of studies on how they affect natural systems, but I was interested in their presence, their functioning in agricultural systems. Yes. Um, and then how does it, what is like the AMF's like role in soil health? Mm, yeah. Um, so, you know, they're, they're kind of multifaceted organisms, you know, mm-hmm. and they, you know, the, one of the key, uh, uh, relationships they have with plants is based on nutrients and this transfer of carbon and nutrients, but they do much more than that. Uh, I talked about these filaments that are, are, you know, going into the soil. One of these things is this like physical, um, enhancement of soil where they're able to, uh, you know, entangle the soil together so you know builds up aggregates uh you know to to then that then helps you know store more water makes this soil spongier is what people sometimes call it but they also secrete um like these sugar like sticky substances called glomalin which actually then sticks the soil together and so then that builds up the physical structure of the soil so there's the chemical part right where the nutrients or they're able to access these nutrients and and then there's a physical part and then there's also this other part where um, the carbon piece, this carbon transfer also really helps. So, you know, these plants fix uh, CO2, right? They take the CO2 down and then, you know, then they give it to these uh, fungi. And then that's one of the main mechanisms why um, soil is thought to be, you know, a potential source of sequestering carbon. It's through these microorganisms. And one of those pathways is from plants to the symbiotic fungi, where the carbon goes down and the fungi 
take these and then it stays in the soil. And so the presence of these symbiotic relationships is a, it's an important vehicle for that uh, sequestering carbon into the soil. So through all these components, um, they're really keystone uh, species in the soil for soil health. And some people even think about them as in the biological indicators for soil health. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Liz, I'm curious, I mean, obviously from hearing Ida talk about it, if I were to write a book and I talked to Ida, I'd want to include it in mine, no matter what it was about. <laughs> it was like so much, <laughs> so like, passionate about it. It's so interesting, but I was wondering like what, what made you specifically want to include this in your book and how, if you see a sort of um, any parallels between the symbiotic relationship between AMF and plants, between um, parallels with that between, um, and how you see like agroecology and farmers who use agro ag agroecological methods. Yeah, I, I think this world that Ida has opened my eyes to and so many people's eyes to through her research and her writing and her speaking is so profound and so important. Um, for me to realize that polycultural farming results in this case in two times as many different kinds of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which are then driving these soil health processes, which are so important in regeneration and carbon sequestration and responses to climate change in agriculture. It's just huge for those of us who I think have long felt like biodiversity is really central to how we design farms and respond to climate change. IDA's research makes that really concrete, especially if we're talking to people who maybe are a little skeptical. <laughs> you can give them IDA's paper. <laughs> um, but then the other thing to me that's really profound about IDA's work and the stories that she's sharing it's just really profound that these polycultural farming systems exist in California's Central Valley at all. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, you know, thousands of years of history of polycultural food systems in what's now Mexico and Central America. Indigenous communities in those parts of the world are, are famous for having these incredible polycultural food systems. And then there was an incredibly well-funded and well-connected effort to replace those food systems with monocultures and this global industrial export-based food system. Probably folks on here have heard of it. It was called the Green Revolution, right? And that started in Mexico. The Rockefeller Foundation, the US government, the Mexican government, their sort of pilot project for what became the Green Revolution was in Mexico. And it was the indigenous-led resistance to the Green Revolution in Mexico that actually gave us the word agroecology, um, brought that movement together. And to think that, you know, people descended from those communities in Mexico, you know, have resisted and resisted and resisted colonialism in many ways, and that food system has forced them to migrate to the United States under incredibly difficult conditions. And they are planting polycultures in the Central Valley and like calling in these microbes. Like that to me is one of the most powerful stories and kind of allegories to carry with me as a person living in 2022, like trying to imagine the future that I wanna live in, that I want my students to live in. It's just so powerful. <laughs> and it, to me, it's a very, very deep story about what regeneration looks like, how it's connected to resistance. And then also, you know, there are Southeast Asian refugee farmers who are right alongside these Mexican American farmers who also have these deep traditions of polyculture and biodiversity. And why are they here? The Vietnam War, you know, which if you think about it, there are deep connections between the Vietnam War and the Green Revolution as part of us, you know, the same imperial project. And so this kind of, you know, uprising of land stewardship and calling in biodiversity um, from groups of people who have experienced all these things, it just, it's incredibly inspiring and incredibly hopeful. And I think it also kind of charts a pathway for how do you do agroecology in ways that really get to the root of the problems that we're all trying to solve in the food system. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, as you were talking, I was just thinking about how, you know, like pesticides, I feel like are by a byproduct of of war and of imperialism. And so then, so to have that other story um, with polycultural farming systems that you see now here in California is really, really cool. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and that just the uh, uh, yeah, it gave me chills when you were talking, Liz. Just like that mm-hmm. push and pull, right? Where you have the Green Revolution displacing farmers, and you have you know then the Imperial Project, the Vietnam War displacing Southeast Asian farmers, right? And then yeah, like for me, that's one thing that also just always like gets me to my core. One of the reasons why I chose to work right where I grew up, right where you know that same sort of Green Revolution and all these pieces that transformed agriculture in Mexico, like push my family here but then then you get these farmers who despite that then they come to this region that's been transformed right one of the I call it the belly of the beast and one of the most like um illustrative pieces of industrial agriculture this uh, this industrial farming project around the world um these farmers come and they are doing something different right that sometimes the very people who've been displaced by those very practices and um approaches to agriculture and just um the way we function in society. Yeah, when you were describing it, Liz, it just gave me chills up again, you know? Mm-hmm. It's way to start the year. Yeah. Um, let's see, where do I wanna go from here? Okay, so earlier uh, we were talking about um, monocultures and polycultures and um, how like the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi show up differently in those different plots of land. Um, but I'm curious, we were talking about uh, talking about like monocultures and regenerative farming. Like, do you think uh, do you think that farming can be like farming can happen regeneratively if it's done and like, if it's just like a monoculture? The <laughs> <laughs> question kept coming up for me. I know that's. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Or what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, wow. Uh. It's like a question asks like undergraduates, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, that's no, that's a good question. Um, or maybe well, I can rephrase it to like, what yeah. are the like limits of regenerative farming? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I guess one one thing I've been thinking about so is you know these farms that I, I've been working with. Uh, one of the main like agricultural practices that I've been focusing on is crop diversity and crop diversification, mm-hmm. and it's at a very small scale, which is you know sharp contrast to these monocultures. And so then, if you think about like how can these monocultures you know like harness some of the uh, benefits or um, that these crop diverse farms can like you know and, and I I think people think about these questions and. I think one of those things has led to, um, you know, organic farming, right? Like, can we uh, reduce the amount of uh, synthetic inputs, but then you end up having these giant monocultures again. And um, I know Liz has worked in the Central Coast, right? You have organic strawberries for miles and miles, right? Um, but it, or lettuce for miles and miles. Um, I should say kilometers, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, one of the, so in the same region so that I work in, so one of the things that people have been trying to think about in, in terms of soil health is how do we incentivize farmers to implement practices that can be more regenerative? And one of the one of the a lot of the funding has gone towards compost. And so a lot of these giant monoculture farms um, have been able to access these incentive incent, incentive programs to apply compost. And so here's this, um, you know, Mediterranean climate's arid, and then they apply compost to these giant fields. And there's uh, a colleague collaborator of mine who, um, Ruth, who we talk, and one thing she likes to say is that it's very, it's free fertilizer, right? One of the things you you can apply a lot of compost, but then you, it, it's it's an access for nutrients, and then you know it decomposes and it provides a lot of nutrients for farms, and then it the what we don't know is like, does it actually help sequester carbon? Um, and I think that's one of the things like you you can apply like one practice, like organic, you can apply, mm-hmm. you know, produce synthetic, you can apply compost. But I think it does, it's not going to get you close to um, what I think a crop diverse farm or farm that's implementing a suite of different practices can get you. Mm-hmm. And so when I think about can a monoculture be regenerative, I think it's hard to think about a field that is just growing just one single thing can get you any close to what a field like a polyculture is providing all the micro hotspots for AMF or pollinators like it's just you can't really create that in you know this monoculture um, region um, 
at least I feel like the research hasn't shown that. I think we can get some benefits from, you know, cover crop rotations, but um, you really need to bring in the diversity. You can't just have just a monoculture over and over and apply compost or reduce synthetic inputs and think we're going to get really strong pushes. And so I think that's like a long-winded response to your answer, Tiffany, but um, I'm more hopeful about uh, practices that diversify ecosystems than the ones that simplify them. Mm -hmm. I guess that's my short answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. I think that's really well said, Ida. And I think, you know, I'm thinking a lot about the farm bill in the U.S. because every five years, yeah. um, this major piece of omnibus legislation comes up um, in Congress. And this is in many ways, like our biggest chance to try to move the needle on our federal policy towards agroecology. And it's been very difficult over the past decades. Um, some incredible folks have gotten some programs established and have increased the funding to them that provides cost share for farmers who are doing these things, who are adding biodiversity through crop rotation and mm -hmm. cover crops and composting and trying to put all those pieces together and also trying to build community food systems around those kinds of mm -hmm. farms. And yet the funding for those parts of the farm bill is so small compared to the kind of legacy parts that are basically propping up these monoculture systems of mm -hmm. you know, soy and corn or wheat in the part of the country where I come from um, that are more kind of these monoculture supported by chemicals. Um, to your point, Tiffany, about the role of chemicals in all of this. Um, and so I think, you know, how do we change the balance of you know, the support that we're giving, we're giving a lot of energy, I think, in policy to trying to make small changes um, to these big farms, because there's this sense of like, well, they cover a lot of the landscape and they have a lot of power. Um, and so I, as I'm thinking about my engagement in farm bill advocacy, I'm thinking a lot about how can we provide opportunities for some of these farmers who may be kind of stuck in conventional commodity monoculture to take the first step towards change and have it be a step that leads to more steps mm -hmm. rather than having it be a type of support that then entrenches the structural power of that type of food system. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a complex question um, for advocates and for folks working in the policy space is essentially like, how do you support the first step in ways that actually move people towards step two, three, four, or the whole system towards step two, three, four, rather than actually inhibiting it? You know, because what I don't want is for somebody to get a cost share incentive just to do no till and then go out there, market their products as regenerative and say we've gotten there because then that's inhibiting change and that's inhibiting support to the more um, kind of the deeper vision of regeneration. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks for answering that question that came out of somewhat left field. I'm <laughs> <laughs> to assign to undergraduates. <laughs> I might take that one, Tiffany. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'd love to talk about the farmers that y'all have uh, researched um, and spoken with throughout your studies. Um, you mentioned, well, specifically the Central Valley, how there's lots of um, Hmong farmers and uh, Mexican farmers. Um, but I'm curious for both of you, not just in the Central Valley, but just across your studies, when you're, especially since you both have been studying like, agroecology, um, what has stood out to you about the farmers that you've spoken with that you've been able to that you've been able to study? Yeah, I think how highly innovative they are. I think that's mm -hmm. um, one thing that continues to just like inspire inspire me, and like and it and it obviously did inspire like the questions I asked. And I think I mean Liz was uh, talking about this earlier. Um, you know, like I guess I grew up in the Central Valley and like I said, it's been a, like the butt of many jokes. And I remember when I started at grad school, even before then, when I was thinking about agroecology, you know, regenerative agriculture, sustainable agriculture, like I would talk about the Central Valley and people were like, lost cause, you know, mm -hmm. like that's the way I think people think about it. And it's, you know, when we think about regenerative agriculture in California, people think about the peripheries, you know, all around and around the Central Valley or this, the right at the core of it. And so I think one of the things for the farmers that, for me, that really like stands out 
is you know the the hope and the glimmers of hope like they really represent sort of what this um landscape can be and what things could be differently when we uh what liz is getting out the farm bill like when we incentivize you know uh certain practices like for me that's one thing i think about like what happens when we incentivize uh these group of farmers more so than um other types of farming practices and that's one part that really stands out to me and the other part is um that i think liz was getting at earlier is that you know in a place that was you know growing um almonds and you know peaches pomegranates all these you know really tasty things these farmers were bringing in taro and ginger and papaya and i can keep going on um and so going to your question of the monoculture piece tiffany uh the other thing I think these farmers is that they're bringing in not only um, the part of farming that produces food, but they're bringing in the part of farming that brings in culture and brings mm. in sort of these other aspects that are really important to, I think, our existence as humans. And, you know, one thing that these farmers really provide is that they're able to grow crops that a lot of these immigrant communities around and all these other communities around um, can eat from. So they're not only sustaining, you know, the below ground biodiversity and the above ground biodiversity, they're also sustaining and nourishing um, communities around, you know, um, we can eat almonds and apricots, but all day. Um, but I think for, um, but I think for communities, like, I think it's so important to eat like culturally relevant foods and to be connected to those pieces of our, who we are as humans. And I think these farmers, that's something that's also stood out for me a lot. Like as someone who is Mexican and grew up in this, in the U.S., like to be able to have farmers that are bringing that part of farming front and center and not just the yield aspect of agriculture. Thank you. Um, yeah, Liz. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think I would just follow by saying I think that experience of that I've seen uh, for so many of the farmers that I've gotten to speak with, their experience of, of living reciprocity with the earth and with the natural world and living relationship with it, um, they have so many interesting things to say about what that means and how it impacts the way they see the world and, and how they live more generally. And so I think, you know, to Ida's point about the incredible multifunctionality of farms like this is that the, the produce is incredible. And I, I, I'm really lucky. I mostly eat stuff that comes from farms like this. And so I can definitely attest to it's delicious, you know, and nourishing. And that alone is a real gift. But the places and the communities um, that these kinds of farms are cultivating and the relationship that they're cultivating between people in the natural world and among people, um, I think that is maybe one of the most important contributions as we think about how to adequately respond to climate change and really shift our whole society's relationship um, with the natural world and each other. Yeah. Um. I know when you were talking about uh, people bringing in like taro and ginger and just all of these other foods and it's like a way of like keeping culture alive and sharing with other people. It reminded me a couple of months ago, uh, I took my my mom who's from South Korea, but hasn't been back since the 80s. Um, wow. And we've always lived like in a city, so don't have like a huge connection to land, but she grew up in, like a on a small farm. And I took her to mm -hmm. Nauru Farm in the winters to see Kristen and it was just so sweet because my mom hasn't been on a farm in so long and she was able to like recognize plants before they were like um before they were like fruiting or anything like that just from like a vine and she was she was i've never seen her so happy and so like lit up just like surrounded by all of these plants that she recognized from her childhood and it was yeah. the most precious thing i'm just gonna try not to cry about it now <laughs> but yeah it was really special and to be able to have that experience to be able to share that with others is yeah it's such a great contribution that we don't talk about or like i don't think it's like as mentioned as much when we're talking about the food system yeah um, and it's, really and it's so i think it's so interconnected to these issues about around like how do we make how do we uh like harness agriculture for you know resilience and addressing the climate crisis we've talked i you know i think as an ecologist i think a lot about the way um agriculture and you know settler colonialism like transformed ecologies right these ecological landscapes um and how that shift in sort of uh, you know the the like grabbing of land and the uh, um, 
consolidating of land parcels, you know, across the Midwest and across the world, um, you know, transformed these uh, these landscapes. But one other thing it did is like it ripped people from these lands. You know, um, mm -hmm. indigenous communities were stripped away from their own lands. Um, uh, one statistic I think a lot about is, you know, formerly enslaved people who were in the South were promised land and then they weren't given that land. And then it led to the Great Migration in the U.S. and they were pushed around. And then even for, um, you know, uh, Hmong farmers we talked about uh, in in the highlands of Southeast Asia, they were also uh, pulled away from the land and also my land. Also, my parents were, you know, pushed away from their own um, farms. And so when we think about the rural agriculture has had on the environment, it's also this piece, right? That um, it's also needs to be like, it's part of the puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. We think a lot about, you know, can we sequester carbon in the soil? Can we uh, bring up yields in agriculture? But one of the impacts in that came hand in hand with the way agriculture transformed the landscape is the impact it's had on people, right? And mm -hmm. that displacement of people from their land, from their food, um, and their culture. And so I think when we're trying to think about the way we want to reimagine the world, that has to be part of it. And I think it's part of the puzzle. Like if we rethink about the ways we want to um, make agriculture responsive to the climate crisis, that piece is so important because it was so important to the way um, agriculture used to function or mm -hmm. has functioned in some parts of the world to this day. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's a very sweet story about your mom, Tiffany. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for sharing that. That's I love that. Um, just thinking about farming in that way. Um, yeah, uh, Liz. Now I've I've got so sidetracked. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> did you were, did you also answer that question about what you what has stood out to you about the farmers you studied? <laughs> Like, yes. Okay. yes. Yes. And I'm not even going to try to follow what I just said. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, but going back to those farmers, um, what are also some of the like challenges, the more like unique challenges that they face? Mm. Uh, I don't know, Liz. Do you want to answer first, or if you want? To yeah. Talk? I mean, so in the United States you know, somewhere between 95 to 98 percent of agricultural land is white owned and land ownership is also consolidating. We're seeing a lot more agricultural land being purchased by institutional investors. So pension funds, folks who are thinking of it really as a financial asset rather than as a relation <laughs> or as, you know, land to be stewarded or as culture. Um, and so I think that's a really, really big challenge, and not only in the United States and other parts of the world, too. Um, I would definitely recommend Madeline Fairbairn's excellent book mm. about land grabbing mm. and how that's really impacting these um, struggles for agroecology all over the world. Um, so we need to address these structural barriers rather than imagining that farmers themselves are going to somehow be able to take all these things on and internalize this transition in their own business models. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So I think that um, land justice is a huge piece. Um, it's what I ended up focusing on in the final section of the book. Uh, there's an organization in California called Minnow that's mm -hmm. doing really, really amazing work around land justice, bringing together conversations between indigenous communities and also folks from communities of color who want to farm and thinking about how we build relationships on land um, to make all of those things possible. <laughs> and that requires new land tenure models and new kinds of agreements and new kinds of cooperatives and things like that. Um, there's also great organizations working on this in other parts of the world too. And then I think um, I think about Olivia Watkins, who's featured in the mm -hmm. second chapter of this book, um, who has an incredible story as a land steward, inherited this land that had been in her family since 1890. Her great great uncle was one of the first black landowners in what's now the Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill Triangle region of North Carolina. She inherited this forested land, decided to to turn it into a forest farm and grow shiitake mushrooms mm -hmm. to kind of keep that sanctuary, uh, both for black people and for wildlife that are now threatened in that area because of the rapid urbanization. And she's gone on to become president of Black Farmer Fund. And we've done a few events together and she talks a lot about how, yes, you know, folks need land access and they also need access to capital, access yeah. to markets, all the things that 
many, many white farmers have had access to through generational wealth transfer, through all kinds of relationships. Um, those things need to, to be in place as well for farmers to be successful in the context of this economy with this agroecological transition. Yeah, that's those. Yeah, yeah, it, it's the land piece, but then the access to one story that um, for me to answer this question, one story um, I've been thinking a lot about for is I was out in the field um, with some colleagues collecting soil samples um, on the, some of the farms that I work on. And so I'm out there with the technical assistance provider that um, works with a lot of these farmers as well. And we're out there and we're trying to collect soil samples for this like incentive program for uh, in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's trying to get a farmer who wants to um, apply cover crops on, on, on their field and is trying to get them a, a tractor. Um, so he's trying, she's trying to coordinate with her neighbor, his neighbor um, to get a tractor. She's trying to get a seeder so they can put out the cover crop seeds. And then he's trying to coordinate with um, him and his son who manage a fruit stand um, to know who's going to take care of it. Someone needs to be there. Um, they also want to do it within a certain time frame because the tractor can only be used between X and amount of time. And, you know, she, we're, we're going to different farms collecting soil samples that need to be collected for this program. But throughout the whole day, like across every farm, she's always on the phone trying to coordinate with all these people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and she's finally at the end of the day, it's getting it together. And this is just for tomorrow. Like, you know, she's been trying to do this um, for a while now. And then she finally gets these pieces. Um, and then, so that's, but she's doing this for a dozen uh, farmers, right? A few dozen farmers uh, trying to coordinate all these pieces as one person. Whereas a large farmer, large farm already has someone already dedicated to that, probably already has a tractor, probably already has a seeder, probably has someone who's going to go and do this. And so, um, when you, yeah, when we think about like the, some of the challenges, I think about that, the access to resources and capital. And then on top of that, um, for some of these farmers to even access some of these incentive programs that have been implemented, they need long leases, land leases. Like, so first of all, some of them don't even own their land, right? But then we talk about that they're renting land, they need long leases. And I kid you not, some farmers I worked with have been on their land for decades and they still have yearly leases. Mm. Every year they have to renegotiate their lease with the landowner, right? And they won't, they won't like renegotiate, you know, longer leases. And so when they're trying to apply for programs that don't qualify because they don't have long enough leases, right? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes they have like two to three year leases and then they get kicked out and then they have to go go somewhere else. So when we think about harnessing these practices, these crop diverse practices, these regenerative practices, what can three years do, right? If you're mm -hmm. kicking out farmers every few years and these practices can't sit there and actually be able to harness these, um, uh, these benefits. Um, so yeah, it's it's land, but it's also it's also capital. It's all these pieces together um, that have to um, that we have to really value in the in who we're gonna support in these agricultural systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just it's so wild to me thinking about the amount of time um, she spends <laughs> coordinating it, and I'm sure it's like unpaid, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, unpaid time. It's like so much of that. I think a lot of things that are something that maybe a lot of like white farmers have that people don't is just like also implicit trust mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in in certain systems or just in like someone randomly calling you up and so also the time it takes to build to build those relationships too. Absolutely, I I tell people like I've been working with farmers now like going on eight years, seven eight years, but. Um, when I, my first year when I was trying to coordinate with all these farmers, I got connected with some colleagues, but then I drove around to probably a hundred plus farms. Um, and then after the year when I got 10 farms, right? And then the next year got 20, 20, like 20 more farmers to come on board, but it took a long time. And then there's like a couple of things that I would have to like try out where um, I wouldn't walk out with the clipboard, right? Because I thought I was an auditor because that's a thing that happens a lot where, you know, they're consistently trying to get audited or, you know, uh, infractions, violations of some sort. Mm -hmm. And um, it took a long time. And um, just this past summer, I like did another field season. Now it's like seven, seven years after I had first gone out and I called up a colleague and it took me two days to gather up 20 farms to sample. Right. And that took, you know, that's almost nearly a decade of like, yeah. of just trying to uh, build up trust. And yeah, so and I don't even think I'm nearly cl as close to where I, I 
I wish I was that, but yeah, there's that piece of it as well. Um, and then, yeah, and then being connected to programs that haven't built that trust, right? Whereas white farmers probably have, you know, decades or generational relationships with some of these, um, you know, offices and programs in the area. Yeah, I think what I'd say is that, um, you know, if you're watching this and you're really concerned about climate change and you're, you're thinking a lot about how do we build climate solutions in agriculture and on a timetable to really address the climate challenge, which is huge. Um, and maybe, you know, you're also really concerned about equity, but you're wondering, you know, are those two things related to each mm -hmm. other? Um, something I've thought a lot about is, you know, roots are key to carbon cycling in agricultural mm -hmm. systems. Um, the uh, carbon secreted by roots is five times more likely to be stabilized below ground than above ground carbon. Roots are really, really central to this whole conversation of regenerative agriculture. And if we want farmers to literally plant roots mm -hmm. and put down roots, we need to make it possible for those farmers to put down roots themselves. Mm -hmm. and. I just can't imagine a stronger tie between equity in agriculture and climate mm -hmm. solutions in agriculture. I see them just really, really strongly connected to each other. Oh, I love the ecologist hat, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I uh, I love that. I love that metaphor of roots and it goes mm -hmm. so deep, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, yeah, like what is a farmer to do if they have yearly leases or don't even right. have access to land and you know and then what if it's only a few acres right you know it's not many roots in area but yeah okay so i'm going to ask one final question um and it's the title of your introduction of the book of healing grounds liz um <laughs> so can soil really save us um which I know if people like, you know, read the book, then they will have like some answers, but I would love to hear from <laughs> you. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm definitely referencing Kristen Olson's brilliant book. So if you haven't mm. read that, um, speaking of all that amazing science about how soil and climate are connected, you should check that out. Um, and I think soil is so important. I think we, I think it benefits one to like read Ida's papers and listen to Ida's talks and get curious about soil. Um, because I think um, these farming systems that have been regenerative in all these indigenous communities and communities of color have been curious about soil and have involved um, people having a sense-based relationship with soil um, as a relation, as as I think maybe some of us do with like above ground critters. <laughs> so I think uh, building those relationships with soil is really central. And I also think um, doing that in a holistic way within this framework of agroecology, within this framework of um, repair, which is both social and ecological is really important. Um, and not to somehow try to see soil as this isolated, um, you know, piece away from people that we can somehow manage into climate balance without tackling these structural issues in agriculture. Mm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I study soil and especially the critters that live in it. So, um, so I, I, you know, I, I do think soil is a key to understanding how we can, you know, transform agriculture systems to address this climate crisis. But and my college's heart is always really hopeful on that piece, but I also think it's absolutely short-sighted and it's um, only part of it. And I think um, like, I think the points we've tried to touch across this is this like equity and justice piece is really important as well. And if you really wanna transform um, these agricultural systems and harness these regenerative practices, you know, like Liz said, we need to allow farmers to establish roots, right? Like it literally, the soil science can't happen without that. Mm -hmm. And and I think for me, yeah, that that part of it's really important. I think ecologists get really, you know, really caught on to like, you know, we can just sequester soil and it becomes sort of like this, you know, just uh, plug in certain numbers and then you can make it work. Um, but it's much more than that. It's all these other more complex and uh, part of it. And so, yeah. And for me, like, I always think about that, like, you know, agriculture can really transform agricultural systems, but we can also be really hopeful about it and the way and thinking about the way people can actually uh, manage this land in a better way. 
Thank you. So I think from what I've been hearing from our conversation today is that there needs to be like a, a an embedding of deeper meaning with like all of these things, not just like thinking about soil health or not just thinking about food or a food system. Um, but there's, yeah, there's all these relationships that go into it and also like our own like personal healing, but sort of like more on a larger scale collective mm. like healing that needs to happen. But we have to do that with, with embedding just meaning into all of our new meaning into all of these things that are maybe seen as inputs. Yeah. So there's much more than that. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much. I know we're going to switch over to a Zoom at the top of the hour for a QA. and a um, but yeah, I just again, want to say thank you both for chatting and also uh, Olivia Watkins, who you mentioned earlier, um, and Black Farmer Fund, they're doing a session tomorrow. Yeah. So if people want to check it out, they should. It's Community Wealth Building for a Racially Just Food System. I think it's going to be fantastic. Um, yeah, so a Zoom link should be um, sent out to everyone shortly, and then we'll be there at the top of the hour. Hi. Right. Thank, thank you so much. You. Thank you both. That was amazing. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Tiffany.